Okay, can you hear me at the back first of all? So, because I know that people have been quite laid back, which is, no. Right, first of all, um, just a quick, um, if I can have my slides up, this is about mapping the opportunities for connectivity in, 20, in 2023, just to kind of take you through the various trends that we, um, that we as Collider Intelligence are seeing in the market, where we think the opportunities are for, um, for growth as things become ever more, ever more connected, kind of going into what connectivity is, how we see that sort of thing moving forward. Uh, just a quick introduction about Collido Intelligence. We are a GSMA member, but we're also um, a, research, um, a research company primarily that um, specializes in connectivity and roaming with um, some additional uh, bits and pieces about, about fintech, but we spend a lot of our time engaging directly with everyone, all the players in the ecosystem to produce our, to produce our reports and we cover everything from wholesale and retail roaming and to things like eSIMs, IPX, private networks, the whole gamut of various bits and pieces of, connect, of connectivity and roaming research and our sort of flagship where we engage with all the vendors is, is the vendor hub and where we get our, really get our finger on the pulse of what the players that are rolling out these connectivity technologies are doing and how they're seeing the market going forward. So. Key trends that we're seeing going forward. I'm just going to give you a headline overview of all of the various things that we're seeing that we're seeing going on from a sort of a topical point of view, first of all, and then dig down into the technologies that are enabling that. So, first of all, connectivity is kind of becoming a, a universal commodity. It's getting to the point that, as you've been saying, that um, that it's not really about the technology that much anymore. It's just that things are connected, they work, and that's sort of the, that's sort of the ideal. People are now looking for solutions-based things rather than what the technology is. So as, as a result of that, you're seeing the line between licensed and unlicensed um, connectivity blurring. You're looking for people trying to deploy though, both types of technologies in the same network um, and those sorts of things. And that's having some implications at the hardware level where you're having some th where you're having people roll out multi chipsets that have multiple types of connectivity, and so there's the expectation that it's if it's a connected device, it's just a connected device. They don't really, um, and the end user doesn't really want to worry about what type of connectivity, whether it's going to fall off if they move it to a different geography, those sorts of things. Uh, we're also seeing quite a shake up in the business models, um, and so we're also um, as some people know, particularly in the low power wide area space, that database monetization is not working particularly well because the data volumes are quite so low and that's having knock on effects for the whole, for the whole sort of ecosystem. There's still a question about monetization of the IoT overall. And so there's a shift going on to try and make the IoT results focused, if you like, again, rather than, um, rather than technology focused. So if they want connectivity for something, then it's a focus of do they deliver what they want to use the technology for. It's becoming a much more a question about how something is being used rather than what it is and how the connectivity technology works. And as part of that, roaming is still... Um, is still a key ch is still a key challenge if you're trying to roll out a technology across multiple jurisdictions in multiple countries. Um, if you're if you're an international IoT firm, uh, then roaming restrictions are growing, and how you tackle those is going to be a key question. Um, and everyone is kind of wanting global connectivity agreements at the moment. If they want something to work, they want it to work everywhere. And so, being able to deliver on that type of arrangement is going to be a key feature moving forward. So first of all, we're talking about private networks. We've just finished a discussion on that. So this is what we're seeing going on in private network space. People are very, very interested um, in private networks. Uh, when you look at the amount of interest there, the survey that we did at la um, last year talking about, um, talking about IoT connectivity in general, those looking to, um, to use IoT um, connectivity, uh, the, you've got 68% people saying that they're considering um, looking into um, looking into pr private networks, um, and you've got 15% of people who are already using cellular IoT using private networks. So, um, but so you've got a lot of interest, a lot of enthusiasm about this, even though private networks is still a relatively new term and a relatively new th um, thing from in terms of buzz for the industry. But there's some uncertainty with that still. Um, because um, over half of those who are considering private networks, they aren't sure whether private network connectivity is the right fit for them. So there's a need for 
some education in the space about what private networks can do, how that's different from Wi-Fi or from, or from public connectivity, how those, all those sections interact is a key message that needs to go forward with the industry so far. And in general, um, one of the other concerns is, is security. Even when people have a private network deployed, they want to know their data is safe and want to know that end-to-end -end, end -end security is a key feature. And so that's something that needs to be kept up. One of the interesting things, though, in terms of adoption for private networks is the idea of cost. When we look at people who aren't interested in private networks, they are more likely to think the cost is going to be too high, whereas concerns about the, about the security, that's a pretty much a constant, even if they've already got a private network. They're still, they're still going to worry about that. So making the business case and the value for private networks is key to actually driving adoption um, for these. Um, for these sorts of things. And as part of that, uh, we're seeing network as a service uh, grow as a business model for that, um, which allows very flexible terms of, terms of deployment, and it's very, very easy to sort of extend it out, what you can, what you can do with a network as a service model, because the terms are so flexible. Um, we're seeing that these are frequently, frequently leveraging uh, neutral host models, um, looking to make the hardware not matter so much. Um, there can be some potential complexity there if you decide that the, the, the company that deployed the network mm -hmm. and you then change up your provider, then there's some negotiations about whether the hardware has been paid for. But overall, eventually, the neutral host model will start to enable those sorts of, um, those sorts of use cases where the connectivity and the service on top of it is one of the key things. And that is... Um, that, and that's sort of driving the interest in making the hardware as, ne as neutral as possible. Um, and as part of that, software-defined networking um, is, so is, going to be a key, is going to be a key feature. So the whole thing is quite flexible on a software level um, as well. So making sure that everything is optimized to the use, to the use case and the business case. Um, so you can start, start making alterations at the software level um, Rather than, rather than the hardware level, because it's all delivered as a service, everything is pretty much ind as independent as it can be from the hardware um, in this sort of setup. And if you've got this sort of piecemeal um, way of rolling it out, sort of, you can deploy some things on a small scale and test, and then roll out a bit more. And then you've also made it easier to target small and medium-sized enterprises, which you're to you can see headline deployments about. 5G networks being deployed on a massive scale at the moment with thousands of devices and hundreds of thousands or millions um, in the same network. But some of the bigger opportunities we think are in the in the smaller side of things. But and you'll see, as a result, you're seeing some network in a box type solutions to address those. But um, if you've got it as a service and you can say, well, we're covering X number of endpoints and over over Y area, and then you can just expand that out and make it a simple billing item that's just somewhere in the operational expenses, it makes it much, much easier for smaller businesses and the wide range of use cases that these smaller businesses are going to happen. Do you think, um, if yep. I may ask yep. a question, because this goes very well to connect to the previous discussion. Absolutely. And uh, we were talking about the 5G private networks, but mm -hmm. do you think that is the 5G features the advanced features and the advanced APIs, mm -hmm. uh, especially around virtualization and yeah. slicing, yeah. Um, that is driving the move from hardware to software mm -hmm. that is enabling the SMEs because the cost at some point will drop, right? Yeah. So the SMEs can partake on this. Is that what is driving the adoption? Yes, it's um, you, what, what, what we're seeing is that quite a few private network um, providers are already just rolling out 5G because, as you said, it was future-proofing. Mm -hmm. And so, but when you've got the 5G architecture there, it's already so flexible, so you can do, you can do so much with it. Mm -hmm. So making it sort of 5G first, if yeah. you like, uh, even if you aren't going to use 5G speeds, which we'll get to uh, later on in the presentation, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, it is those network features that are driving 5G. It's not, it's not the super-fast whiz-bangs exactly. that you get. It's, the, it's down to the architecture and how that works. Every single customer uh, that I've been talking to about 5G private networks or when uh, either through MEV or the other operations that I do, mm -hmm. it really comes down to speed. The conversation, like speed is the last thing, is expected, you know, yeah. the, the speed. It's not something, it's not a feature. It's the other benefits that yeah. come along with it. And security is on the top. I mean, latency yep. is key for some of the use cases. 
but yeah. is the virtualization and the flexibility that's top of mind most of the time. Yes, and you'll also see that kind of that thought of flexibility also driving some of the business models because mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the survey that we've, um, in this survey, I don't know whether we've got anything on the slides for this, mm -hmm. but there's a marked interest in um, in managed services for this sort of thing, just to make sure that um, make sure that the networks are the, and the connectivity are deployed and they just work, mm -hmm. um, just so you can get to making the most out of the connectivity rather than trying to um, trying to run it yourself. Um, some of the bigger enterprises may want to kind of toy with it and do a and do a little bit of a hybrid between self service and managed service just mm -hmm. to build up their own in in house knowledge because they can afford to. But yeah. again, going back to the SMEs use cases, you're, you're going to Lots of businesses aren't going to want to do that. Exactly. So, so being able to provide managed services on this sort of thing is absolutely key. Thank you. And on to the LP1. I've already teased a few things uh, about this um, in, the, in the initial. We've seen multimodal um, LP1 hardware, um, which is linking up with people wanting use case specific things and being able to tailor the networks and everything to what an individual um, deployment is, go is going to be. So, um, but for that, you need to be able to service everything. So cellular LP1 is still quite a patchwork internationally, as you can see. Um, we've got, um, just to translate the, the, co um, the color codes on that, red is jurisdictions where it's LTEM only, blue is uh, NBIOT only, and purple is both. And so, and while you can say, so we'll just deploy NBIOT and you can go everywhere apart from Mexico, um, it's still something that's going to be in flux as more com as more countries reevaluate re what their um, what they will allow on their networks um, at an operator level um, and so you, and but now everyone is offering everything including some cellular fallback it, more generally it's historically been 2g 3g but it's increasingly moving now to LTE um, because the 2g and 3g networks are shutting down. Um, but you're going to need to differentiate from competitors on the software level and the services you can provide um, for this. Um, for this, if you're going to want to deploy um, L deploy LP1 at um, at scale, and you are going to need multi connectivity to do that, particularly if you're outside China. Uh, just to give you a, a picture on that, this is our forecasts for the amount of um, LP1 connections that are going to run to 2027. Uh, the biggest bar there, the blue bar, is NBIOT, and the green is LTEM, which means, from a raw numbers perspective, that looks like um, LT NBIOT is just going to be the only game in town, right? But you then look at that, those numbers without China, and it becomes a lot more even. So, so it's very yeah. interesting because yeah. with NBIOT, it's stationary. Yeah. Which you would think like the use cases, you know, in a smart city environment where it's like mm. it will be for lights or, or buildings, but not something that travels. And yeah. that's the benefit with LTM or the major differentiator, I would say, between the two. Is yeah. that you can take with LTM, you can travel, you can move, and you don't need, because it gives you big, bigger range. Range is the, the key. Yeah, absolutely. And as, we, as you see, it sort of start, um, the kind of the NBIOT market starts to sort of take off towards the end of this. Yeah. Um, that's precisely for that for that sort of a reason that um, people are thinking about the mobility use cases and the, the slightly more high value stuff more than they are about just um, just connecting the stationary things. And it's only when you start to get to the point where everything is connected that the lower end things become connected um, because there's not so much value mm -hmm. um, per connection, if you like, um, in how in how those sorts of things work. And so that's what that's why that is. And roaming still remains quite ad hoc in, um, in the space as well. And LTEM has an advantage there because you can, generally speaking, fall back on, um, on, for, on 4G or LTE connect connectivity um, with an LTEM, LTEM, even if the operator doesn't have an explicit LTEM um, agreement in any of these countries, say. So if you want to deploy in Africa, mm -hmm. then you can run something on LTEM. It won't be hugely efficient from a power perspective, yeah. but it's possible, in, which in a way that it's not with NBIOT. Um, and so, and, but that, that whole power conversation means that we're still seeing roaming devices continue to underperform. The, um, you need, need explicit agreements mm -hmm. for things like power saving mode and EDRX and that sort of thing, and they're not coming along at all. No, and um, so. I mean, we're gonna have a long way to go because yeah. 
um, a lot of the providers will need to change the hardware. And you know there is a lot of legacy hardware mm. out there that is not done for the new use cases. No. LTM, NB-IoT, forget 5G. And we're, we, yeah. you know, we're talking about the new technology. And what is on the field at the moment is last technology, right? Yeah. And which makes it very difficult when we start talking about uh, business uh, models and where we go. Mm. But before we get into that, and I know that's yeah. what you're going to cover next, question for you around roaming. And what yeah. effect would iSIM, eSIM will play to the whole, you know? Ah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get oh, to I'll that. be patient. I'll be patient. <laughs> yes. Um, that's yes. Um, but as you say, the kind of the business model problem for um, for LP1 is still quite unresolved because LP1 is, is sending so little in the way of data. Mm -hmm. um, then charging per the megabyte is just not going to get you anywhere because you'll be having a couple of megabytes a month per connection, which is peanuts, frankly, um, in in terms of in terms of revenue. So people are kind of look are trying to look for ways to make that um, to make that a more viable business model. So you were seeing so things like um, things like BCE. Um, they're they're pushing for other ways to make um, other ways to make the monetization work. So moving things like a per connection um, revenue. So and these things will they'll be pushed to the end user like that potentially. Um, so whoever's whoever's deploying, they'll probably be charged on a per connectivity basis. And we're seeing that um, we're seeing that roll around. But on the ho on the wholesale level, um, BC is going to bring those is going to bring those sorts of changes as well. It's not something that's necessarily going to land entirely this year because. BCE implementation is still a little sketchy, but um, or it's not it's not quite finished yet by any stretch. It's kind of only beginning, but um, at, that's sort of one thing that's going to enable LP1 in particular to um, to succeed when you can move away from that database model. And so, yeah. And I'm trying to think. I've sorry, you've um, you've gone through, you've gone through and kind of preempted the things. This is um, this is the survey. Um, that, that we came up with. This is sh um, this is showing when BCE implementation is going to um, is going to be expected to roll out. So um, this is from a relatively old survey. So things may, um, things may be changing um, may be changing slightly, but this coming year is going to see some of the um, some of the bigger implementations of, of, B of BCE, and then the business model changes that we've been talking about will start um, will start to follow through. And now we're on to Eason. <laughs> Yes. Now so. the exciting uh, <laughs> excitement starts, folks, because this is important for everyone. Being yep. involved or not involved with IoT services when it comes to roaming and eSIMs, iSIMs, mm -hmm. it affects anybody in the industry. Yes, and just to kind of follow up on that with a um, with a sneak with a sneak peek, if I've got the right slide, no, I haven't. Um, it's that um, we asked our connect our connectivity server we did last year, mm -hmm. um, saying that um, said that. Of us and the enterprise, all the enterprises we surveyed, over 80% are starting to use eSIM. But um, exactly what using eSIM means is questionable. As we say, there's high, high adoption, but we're seeing quite low activation rates. Mm -hmm. They're seen as a sort of a just in case type technology. So you can have an eSIM plugged in um, to mean that you, if you change out of your um, out of your area for coverage, you can then change to um, change operators and make that. And make that switch, but the number of people actually doing that is quite low. What we're seeing um, in how it's in how it's deployed is that instead of like the way it was originally envisioned, that you would have an eSIM with bootstrap connectivity that would have just enough data on it to load a profile to allow you to connect somewhere, um, and then you can change as you need to based on fuller cellular contracts. We're just seeing a, a, a a bootstrap profile, or an effect, or a first loaded profile, I should probably say, mm -hmm. that um, that is global connectivity, and you never need to change generally, um, unless you come up against any of the roaming restrictions, which we have on the slide here. So, unless you're going to any of those ones where you will need a local profile uh, rather than a global one that you can then use to roam anywhere, um, mm -hmm. that's that. It's basically becoming sort of a case of they sh and they just want to say this is the one profile you'll ever need and then profile switching becomes an exception based and on the thing. first session earlier today yeah. during the beyond connectivity yep. nick earl mentioned the, the example in the us that uh, it would give them three months to turn off yeah. the service that's where an, an e-sim solution will help you not to lose connectivity because Absolutely. you're locked in 
Yeah, absolutely. That's and that's where um, we'll we'll see kind of the alternatives for profiles being deployed very much in North America because as you can see that um, from the slide, North America is one of the places where you've got those very very hostile MNOs who do not want roaming connections on their networks indefinitely. So that's one of the key places to sort um, to sort of change away from, um, if you like, and. Just on a sli um, the slightly technical le level, the way that um, those overall profiles are being managed, you're seeing a combination of eSIM and multi IMSI um, that you'll have that global multi IMSI profile that will then change up, and then the local profile is what you switch to um, with one or two, um, maybe, well, depending on how international your devices need to go, we're seeing maybe up to about three profiles um, per device maximum um, for, um, for these because. Of the way that com international companies are rolling out, they're only needing them if they touch on any of these restricted geographies. Um, and we've also seen, from the last point on um, on eSIM, the latest IoT spec um, is opening up the ecosystem, but it's being um, but it's being bound by similar constraints to the pr um, to the previous specs. Because the reason for that being um, is that. Being able to provide um, to provide profiles um, and provide it through the EIM structure that um, the, the ability to serve profiles will be something that we see being added to existing um, remote remote service pro or remote SIM RSP providers um, remote um, remote SIM provisioning um, services. So it's it's an easy thing to bolt on um, to to those to those sorts of platforms. And so there is some possibility for business model shakeup that was talked about when the spec was originally released, but we, we're one of the ones that thinks that's not going to do a huge shake up in the market because the existing players can add things to their, um, to their platforms um, a bit more easily. Um, and uh, and uh, but at the moment, the kind of the last thing I want to say about eSIM is that, as you're saying, the idea of switching profiles is still the top of mind thing, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not seeing that happen an awful lot. So. It's question. It's question of the ecosystem is maybe looking at the ro the wrong thing at the moment still for um, for eSIM, so that they can um, and they need to think about well how else can we think about the practicalities for this. One of the things that came out of the sur um, of the survey that we did is that eSIMs um, align with with um, environmental targets. So if you can have um, if you can have things built in, um, and then you save on materials, you save on deployment costs and all that sort of thing. Okay, um, and so you and so you've got to think that what other ways can eSIM benefit um, benefit the end user as well as or the device designer as well as the um, as well as the much publicised talk about profile switching. And we've got um, 5G. Uh, I'm going to make this one fairly quick because we've talked about it a lot already. But the um, network architecture is um, a key feature um, for 5G at this point because. Not that many use cases need the, need the speed for it, um, and we're seeing that meaning that non-standalone is the main driver for 5G network deployments. From the graphic here, um, that we're talking about 5G roaming in this um, in this question, admittedly, but you can see that the intent to bring in non-standalone and, and versus standalone, non-standalone is always going to be more appealing at this point because it's a lower infrastructure cost um, and. It, you can deliver much of the same benefits because of the way that the, the, the speeds aren't quite there. Um, we only have a couple minutes, but yes. a lot of folks do not do not come from the um, IoT background in 5G. So, what is standalone and what's not standalone might okay. not be known. Yep, fair enough. Um, just to clarify that one, um, standalone is um, a standalone 5G network is a network that's built for 5G from the ground up. So you're talking. Uh, you're talking a core, a network core that's built for 5G, and all of the access points are built for 5, built for 5G. Non-standalone, which has been rolled out first in most cases, is that the network core is still 4G and LTE based, and you're looking at things at the at the RAN level, um, the, the, and that and that side of things, and it's much more software-based implementation almost um, for um, for 5G networks, and it's, so it's simpler to roll out and with some uncertainty about the 5G use cases, that's the, the sort of the dominant theme um, here because people don't really need the, fi the 5G capabilities so much. So that's why we're seeing some hesitance in mm. less intensive 5G rollouts. And 
I will skip over this. Yes, I will. <laughs> I've got carried away. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Good stuff. Good stuff. And finally, finally, satellites. Um, sa um, satellite is um, is becoming much more interesting. Um, and let's talk about glo truly global coverage because there's a stat that you'll quite frequently see that only 20% or so of the globe has proper cellular connectivity. So cellular, um, so satellite, sorry, as a way to make up the gaps in cellular for some use cases is, is necessary. And so we're also seeing some um, implementations of on-demand coverage essentially for, um, for satellites. There's, um, you can see satellite-like things like balloons and that sort of thing that can provide those sorts of services to sort of supplement. Um, but satellites are, um, satellites as a whole are not something that's going to really take off next year too much because of all the, the cost of infrastructure. It's quite an intensive space, and the business models are still um, are still questionable because it costs so much to look to launch. The the charges mean that it's only ever going to be an exceptions based um, piece of um, piece of technology. So, and it's also something that if you are dealing with th um, with kind of hundreds of thousands of connections through the same. Um, through, through the same model, it's um, also questionable as to whether the connections can stand it because you need to rely on the strength of the constellation. It's not something you can really roll out to support in quite the same way. So um, I'm sort of skipping through things, but just a quick recap. Um, just deployments in the technology need, need to be universal in scope. We need, in when you're dealing with, um, uh, when you're dealing with uh, things that are trying to, are trying to, are trying to be truly global, um, you need to be able to implement multiple technologies to kind of pull that all together. So it almost needs to be like the, the that saying about the swan or the duck, whichever mm -hmm. one it is, that you see them gliding through the water, and but under under the surface, there's a lot of churning going on um, as as the thing kind of um, gets um, goes through goes through the water. And so you need to be able to bring all of these different connectivity types together to provide that to provide the use case and the business case, mm -hmm. end, and it's the business case end that people are going to be worried about. Um, so. There's a case of get it done, but don't really worry about how. Um, international coverage is still something that's quite key, and there's still questions to be asked, particularly about roaming agreements, as, as ever, everyone's pain. Um, and, fi and finally, um, the implementation of 5G and changes to the business model still need to go hand in hand. Because 5G is so flexible, you need to be able to match that with similar levels of business and model flexibility, which is where things are potentially going to be a little bit a little bit slow. We'll start to see 5G technologies roll out next year, but the business models still have some time to catch up. Well, James, thank it. you so much for your presentation. Thank I you. know we had to rush through yep. it, but um, these subject matters are so mm. big yeah. that we are not do giving it, uh, you know, this full justice in yeah. 30 minutes. And I, for one, have a lot of questions, but we're out of time. I would love Sorry. to talk to you about Leo and satellite yeah, yeah. and what you see with that, but we'll take it outside Absolutely. on the corridor and we'll talk <laughs> about that. So thank you so much. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah.